Only about two or three years ago, I really started making an effort to dive into the big Nintendo titles. I've never been a big fan of these characters or games, but each time I've been fairly impressed by what I was playing. Has Kirby and the Forgotten Land won me over too? Let's see in my review. First and foremost, I'm no fan of platformers. I actively avoid them, to be honest. Yet, like I said, the last few years I've been actively trying to explore this side of gaming a bit more. Thankfully, Nintendo tends to be pretty good at making them, apparently. Kirby, thankfully, is a low-stress, fun ride. The visuals are bright and cheerful from start to end. It really was a pure, jolly adventure that definitely landed at the right time. Coming back to the real world after the long haul of Elden Ring, Kirby's stress-free romp was really welcome. The various environments are all well-realized and interesting to explore. From the opening grassy fields to the desert found later in the game, they were all great. The small flourishes really sell it though. Stuff like snowflakes, heat waves, and even all the trash around the game complement things greatly. Oh, and the music is pretty good too. Gameplay is where I was the most impressed. At its core, it's a simple platformer. And while I've never played a traditional Kirby game to compare it to, I really enjoyed it. You proceed through each level running, jumping, fighting, and solving small puzzles. It was surprisingly stress-free though. Even on the default wild mode, I was never pressed too much with difficult moments. That said, there are definitely some segments here to test your understanding of the mechanics. Perhaps the best part of it all, though, was the gradual ramp-up. The opening areas are delightfully simple, but in later portions of the games, the layers were adding up in fun ways. I do, however, wish the game brought these on a bit more quickly throughout the adventure, but I honestly didn't mind it. Of course, Kirby is known for its absorbability, and it's here in full effect. Absorbing certain enemies gives you their abilities, bringing a lot of variety to both movement and combat much to my surprise. For example, the fire ability lets you use flame breath, but also it has a dash. The ice ability lets you freeze and slide. There are even some later functionality that isn't explained directly, but can be easily inferred, such as ice being able to skate on lava. Perhaps that's the most impressive part of the whole game for me. While you do get little tips about what abilities can do, and you can even talk to an NPC to get a bigger breakdown, the amount of intuitive, just try it moments added so much enjoyment for me. Grabbing the air blast and blowing away sand piles, when you've used this air blast many times before, but never for sand, just working unprompted was really neat. And I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the new mouthful mode. This has Kirby absorb an object that's just a little too big for the pink guy and they're used in all manner of ways to get around or solve puzzles. A car to race around and break barriers, a giant cone to break floors, and even a glider to name a few. It never overstayed its welcome, and they're sometimes used in ways I didn't expect. Then there's combat. Each ability can do damage, but none felt any more useful than another. I really like the freedom that each stage and boss encounter had thanks to this. I also really like the simple variety they have with multiple attacks that can be done. The ring weapon for example is ranged, but up close it does a really cool high damage combo. Or the drill that creates an earthquake when a full circle is made. Each was fun to use and figure out. There's even a dodge to slow down a la Bayonetta, making combat even more interesting and fun. You can even upgrade them as you progress in the game, offering slight changes to damage, functionality, and even look. These upgrades are done by finding blueprints in the various stages, as well as resources to unlock them. It adds to the list of collectibles that you need to be looking out for. Speaking of collectibles, there's a small variety here that never felt stressful to collect. You need to find a certain amount of MacGuffins to move on to the next area, but I was happy to see that by simply doing stages and exploring lightly, I can move on to the next area without needing to replay, unless I wanted to. There's plenty of reason to redo stages if I miss something or to find a new secret area since it all helps unlock things. There's a large number of challenge missions too. 
At their core, they're about as easy as the rest of the game. But these challenges are meant to test your understanding of a particular ability or mouthful form. They're fairly lenient in their basic completions, but more determined people can go for the challenge times for extra coins. The main reward lets you upgrade abilities, so it's nice of them to not make them too difficult to complete. That said, they definitely get more interesting in the later half of the game, just like the main stages. They were never frustrating, but actually pretty fun to do. Also, the main hub in the game has a small variety of mini-games, much to my surprise. A coliseum, fishing, a matching game, and more. All of these are pretty neat little side distractions, but nothing were too amazing. That said, there are some awards that can only be gotten by doing them at least once. As someone who actively avoided platformers almost all of their gaming life, this one was a joy to play from beginning to end. It never got too difficult, and the jolly vibes are really welcome. There's plenty of stuff to do and see even after rolling credits, much to my surprise. For completionists, it might be a more meaty adventure than expected. So all in all, Kirby and the Forgotten Land is a really easy recommendation for me. But that's all for now. Be sure to like and follow, leave a thumbs up, and all the other good stuff. I hope to see you again next time, and thanks for checking out my review.